Usually when we find out what's wrong with a person, it's usually because there is something missing or something is interfering. We need to take something out of the body. The caveat of all healing is the gut. And I'm going to teach you some new things that you may not have known about the toxicities and what they're doing physiologically in the body. Isn't that cool medicine? I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, see, that's real. See, because you're finding the root cause of the problem. That's what you got to find. What is the cause of the problem? And so this was my dream of medicine in 1992. This is how much I've been thinking about this stuff. <laughs> I live it, breathe it, touch it, feel it. <laughs> I can't stop learning more about it. So I always wanted to teach the way I like to learn. So the way that I tell you guys things is the way I learn the stuff. And so, because I figure that if I can learn it that way, anybody can learn it that way. So that's why I share this knowledge with you in this kind of fashion. And everything I tell you, that means I've seen it over and over again in my clinical environment. That way I can talk about it. On behalf of Nature's Pantry, I want to welcome you here tonight for our lecture, Whole Body Cleansing with Dr. Gaetano Morello. Nature's Pantry would like to welcome back Dr. Morello. To, uh, he was last here in February of 2010. Dr. Morello is a naturopathic physician practicing in West Vancouver, Canada. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of British Columbia and is Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine from Bastyr University of Natural Health Sciences in Seattle, Washington. Since 1991, Dr. Morello has been training and educating physicians, pharmacists, and health experts on the scientific use of natural medicines in the fields of cardiology, immunology, gastroenterology, anti-aging, and detoxification. Contributing author to the authoritative text on alternative medicine, a textbook of natural medicine, he is also author of The Fiber Miracle, Lecturer and regular contributor to a number of magazines, journals, and publications, Dr. Morella has hosted and appeared on numerous television and radio shows discussing the power of natural medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Morella to Nature's Pantry. When I do presentations, I always ask, anybody heard me talk before? Because I like to tell everybody, or my audience, how I got involved in naturopathic medicine, and it really happened 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, um, I was, uh, I was studying medicine. I was going to become a surgeon. And um, 30 years ago, my mother was uh, hypertensive. She was uh, suffering from high blood pressure. And she was on a drug at the time called Cataprey, clonidine hydrochloride. And her blood pressure wasn't normalizing. And my, my grandfather had died of a heart attack. And my aunt had died of a stroke at the age of 52. And so we were really worried about my mother. She was often faint, pass out. She had no energy. Um, and wow, is mom next? And... Uh, my best friend's uncle, Rudy Volpe, told me about his doctor, Dr. Roger Rogers. When he first told me about this guy, I go, geez, that sounds like a cartoon character. Roger Rogers, what a name. And he goes, you know, you should go see Dr. Roger Rogers because he uses natural products to treat patients. And uh, he goes, look at me, look how healthy I look. And he was, he was a very, Rudy was a very healthy looking guy and he was a very uh, uh, successful businessman. So I, I went to see Dr. Roger Rogers and he told me about the incredible relationship between uh, diet and, and blood pressure and that stress can elevate blood pressure and that foods can elevate blood pressure and that there's these little tiny herbs that they use in Europe that can help regulate blood pressure. And so anyways, uh, within the next two months, I, uh, I read everything I could find on, on high blood pressure. Um, and uh, we developed a protocol for my mother, but before we could put her on that program, uh, we went to see, uh, I went to see my family doctor, Dr. D'Amico, who had uh, written my letter of recommendation to medical school and been a doctor since, she's been my doctor since I was a little boy. And so I say, hey, Dr. D'Amico, I want to see this Roger Roger character. And he told me all about this relationship between a diet and hypertension. And, you know, there's some science to this. What do you think of we put mom on this program? And, you know, for some strange reason, 30 years ago, she agreed to do it. 
which is odd, right? That's what I thought. And so we did it. And uh, lo and behold, within three months, my mom was off the catapray and her blood pressure normalized. It's been normal ever since. And so I said, wow, that's unbelievable. Why wasn't she put on this program before? Yeah. It worked. And, you know, one of the things that we, I discovered was that there was really a lot of, there wasn't a lot of education on, on the, the environment and its impact on health. And, and also, uh, something that I use, you know, some, some events in your life just change everything. And one of the botanicals we used was called Critagus oxycantha, hawthorn berries. And hawthorn berries, they, it does four things in the body. One, it increases the endotropic effects of the myocardium, allows heart muscle to contract more efficiently, something that the joxin does. Secondly, it acts as an ACE inhibitor. Anybody heard of an ACE inhibitor? Yes. An ACE inhibitor is the second most prescribed uh, antihypertensive drug. And what it is, is there's a hormone in your body called angiotensin. Angio for blood vessel tensin squeezes blood vessels. An ACE inhibitor reduces the formation of this hormone. So if you have less of this hormone circulating, you can get more relaxed blood vessels. That's the second thing it did. The third thing, it acts as a diuretic, the most prescribed antihypertensive drug is a diuretic. And fourth, it was a specific antioxidant for the cardiovascular system. So I said to myself, I go, holy smokes, there's an urban nature that does four things that we try to mimic in pharmacology? Is there other herbs in other parts of the world and other things out there that do other things for other parts of the body? And uh, the answer to that question was yes. So I said, hey, uh, this is a great career. I want to get into this stuff. And so I, uh, I, I, I transferred. I went to Bastyr to study naturopathic medicine. And uh, I did the, a lot of things happened to me in Bastyr. I, I learned a lot about uh, the scientific aspects of naturopathic medicine. I met some really cool people you probably have heard speak before, Dr. Michael Murray. Uh, uh, yeah, we, were, we actually became roommates. He was my teacher. And uh, so I started doing a lot of research for his books. So one of my jobs was to go to the uh, University of Washington Library and extrapolate, go through 400 different journals a month and extrapolate. We'd, we'd, we collected a database of over 60,000 articles scientifically validating natural medicine. One of my goals when I graduated was to go and talk to as many people as I could and, and share my, my story and teach them about the benefits of medicine. I've been practicing medicine for 22 years now. So I have a private practice and I also work at a hospital, a women's hospital in, in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, we just actually opened up the complex chronic disease uh, clinic over there. It's one of the few in, uh, in North America where it's all mainstream, but we do have alternatives. I provide the alternative stuff. So that's my story. But to finish the story, in 1994, I was doing a lecture in Victoria, British Columbia to a, a group of medical doctors and pharmacists. So I'm doing this lecture. Anybody hired me to talk before? Nobody put up their hands. So I go, I'm going to tell you my story. And so as I'm telling my story, guess who's in the audience? Dr. Roger Rogers. So I learned from that thing. You know, always tell the truth when you're telling a story because you never know who's in the audience. And you know, Dr. Rogers passed away five years ago. And there is a scholarship that's awarded to physicians called the Roger Award to physicians who really practice alternative medicine. He was an MD, practice alternative. It's hundred thousand dollars a year that you get this this person. It's quite, it's quite, quite the. Uh, he, he became quite the famous man. So, anyways, that, that was the end of my story. So today we're going to talk about something completely different outside of hypertension. We're going to talk about actually detoxification and digestion because really, the caveat of all healing is the gut. And I'm going to teach you some new things that you may not have known about the toxicities and what they're doing physiologically in the body. I bring this picture up. This is pretty interesting. Uh, the Pacific Gyre. And this is an area in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. A gyre, you know, is an area that swirls and collects things. And believe it or not, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, there's an area that's the size of Alaska that's littered with garbage. It's floating plastics. Can you believe that? <laughs> an area of the size of Alaska just floating because of all the stuff that people put into the water. And it just collects. And it's floating, and these plastics are breaking down and they're getting incorporated into the ecology of the oceans. Do you know almost all the fish you consume now have mercury in them, right? Do you know they did an, an analysis of 365 creeks and rivers in the United States? They found mercury in every water source, no matter how isolated that water source was. So really, we've got, we got a lot of problems with our pollution, and we'll talk about that in the, in the later half of the, uh, of the lecture. To start, I always bring up this slide, and this is basically the start of conditions. And when you look at a condition, 
usually when we find out what's wrong with a person, it's usually because there is something missing or something is interfering. We need to take something out of the body. So for example, is there something missing? For example, if you're missing B12 or iron, what do you become? You become anemic. If you're missing protein, you could get protein deficient and you can have blood sugar problems, you can have muscle fatigue, you can have lots of issues. So a lot of times there's something missing. This is where supplements come in. That's why we, we prescribe supplements, so we give out supplements to provide the missing piece. And then sometimes there's something we need to avoid. Like for example, I see in the back there's a lot of gluten-free products and we've learned that gluten has a lot of issues and a lot of problems. I'm going to share with you why that is as part of this discussion. So then we find out, is there something we need to avoid? Right now, science is showing that there's a lot of stuff that we need to avoid or we need to remove out of our bodies that's causing a lot of interference patterns, creating all sorts of issues. Like for example, have you noticed that you know, we're getting more cancer now than we have before? Have you noticed that we spend billions and trillions of dollars on cancer research and are we any closer to resolving the problem? I don't think we are. So what is it? What's causing it? Have you ever heard of carcinogens? That's a compound that can cause cancer. So that's something that we need to avoid. Something that's interfering with patterns. I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove to you how the environment can actually change the way your DNA behaves. I'm going to prove it to you. See, and then you're going to say, yep, that's exactly it. I believe it, 100%. A lot of times when we think of digestion, we think of the gut, we think of digestion. You know, we think of, you know, what it does. It's all digestion, but it's not. There's a lot more to the gut than just digestion. For example, we know that, you know, the gut is an area where, you know, the, the food that you just ate is getting broken down, then you get absorbed, the nutrients get absorbed into your bloodstream. Yeah, the, we all know that. We also know that it's an area where we eliminate things. So we, we eat, we break it down, we absorb into our, into our bloodstream, and then elimination. So that's all everybody knows. But did you know that your gut uses tons of energy to break down foods? A lot of energy. And the more enzymes you have to... Anybody know what enzymes are? Enzymes are little things that... These proteins that break down your food so you can, you, can, you can absorb it. And your body has to make these enzymes, and we'll go through them, has to make them to be able to break down those foods. And do you know how much energy it takes to make those enzymes? Lots of energy. Tons of energy. Have you ever noticed that after a meal you feel really tired when you have a big meal? You ever wonder why? <laughs> I should feel more energetic, right? I'm putting all this food in my system. It's because your body's got to make a lot of these proteins, these enzymes, to be able to break down those foods. And it takes tons of energy. So one of the ways that you can increase your energy in your body is by supplementing with enzymes if you're eating heavy meals. That way your body doesn't have to produce as many enzymes and you'll have more energy. So very few people, very few people know that enzymes actually can give you energy. Did you know that 80% of your immune system is located in your gut? How many people know that? Well, there's a lot of people. Now, okay, how many people know why 80% of your immune system is located in your gut? Anybody watch Jeopardy? <laughs> So what is your immune system? Your immune system is your defender of your body. It defends you from viruses, from bacteria, from parasites, from cancer. Of course, it defends you from all these things. So if it's a defender of your body, think about a house. If you were to guard the house from burglars, where would you put the guards? You put them in the front door and the back door, the main entry point. The reason why... 80% of your immune system is looking because that's your main entry point to the external environment. If I took my intestinal tract out and I would spread it out, it would cover a tennis court. That's a huge area. And that area is exposed to a lot of external environment. It's exposed to all the food you consume, the air, some of the air that you breathe, the water that you drink. The biggest exposure is there, therefore the immune system is located there. Therefore, if you have bad digestion, will it impact your immune system. Yes, it will. You see? So keeping the immune system healthy, is pr keeping the digestive tract healthy becomes pretty important. Another thing that very few people know is that the gut is a major center of neurotransmitter production. Anybody heard of a neurotransmitter? Okay, anybody heard of serotonin? Okay, serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It's the neurotransmitter that makes you feel good. When we 
Antidepressants try to increase the levels of serotonin, the feel-good hormone. Well, guess what? Your gut produces as much serotonin as is produced in the brain. Whoa! That was a shock to my system. The gut produces as many brain chemicals as the brain does. It's called the second brain now. And think about this. Now, one of the ways that you can think about this, really, you're, my, my stomach, my, my gut produces that many chemicals? Yes, it does. Think about a quadriplegic. A quadriplegic has no control from the neck down, right? Yet, the quadriplegic can fully digest foods. They can't swallow because they don't have the gag reflex, but they can fully digest. Why? Because the gut has its own nervous system. Therefore, when you have bad digestion, will this nervous system be affected? Will these, the production of these neural transmitters, yes it will. And that can cause all sorts of problems. And what we've learned now is that there's tons of other chemicals, neurotransmitters that are produced in the gut. Like you heard about ghrelin? Ghrelin sounds like some kind of cartoon, right? Another cartoon character. Ghrelin is a hormone that's produced in your stomach that creates hunger. That's why you get hungry. If you had no ghrelin, you would never be hungry. That's produced in the stomach. Leptins are produced in the adipose tissue. They make you feel full. So there are compounds produced in the gut that control hunger, which end result is they control our ability to lose or gain weight. And the last thing, and the last two things, I mean, this is the last thing, but the la another thing is, do you know how much bacteria live in your gut? B trillions of bugs live in your gut. And these bugs, because we always think of bacteria as bad for you, right? But these bacteria are really good for you really good for you. They're so good for you, you won't believe it. You don't believe it? <laughs> Anybody heard of, I'm going to give you an example of how important these bacteria are. Anybody heard of C. difficile? Yes. Some people have, right? Okay, let me tell you what C. difficile is. C. difficile, no, it's not here. I was looking for something. I forgot. I don't know where I put it. C. difficile is a bacteria that you can contract. Say that you go on clindamycin you can get C. difficile. Sometimes when you're in the hospital, you can contract C. difficile. And C. difficile is very difficult to get rid of. You get diarrhea and you can't get rid of it. So let me give you an example. Female, 30-year-old female in the hospital contracted C. difficile. This is a documented case. IV antibiotics for three months. In the hospital, every day IV antibiotics for three months still could not get rid of the C. difficile. The woman lost almost 40 pounds. And this is what happens, you lose a lot of weight. You know what they did? So the most powerful antibiotics in the world could not treat her. So you know what they did? They went into her husband's gastrointestinal tract, they isolated bacteria, and they inoculated her with those bacteria, and the C. difficile disappeared in two days. They have repeated the same experiment thousands of times with the same results. So the bacteria in the human gut is more powerful than the most powerful antibiotic that we've ever made. Think about that. So how important are these bugs in here? They're pretty important. You just see all the things they do. I can't even believe it. If you were asking me this 20 years ago, I'd say, what are you talking about? That's why one of the things that I learned in my life, always go with an open mind because you never know. So be open and listen because listening is pretty important. Some people never listen. You know, <laughs> some of my colleagues, <laughs> some of my mainstream colleagues, they don't listen. Oh yeah, they got it all figured out. And let me tell you something. The person who thinks that they know it all knows nothing. Always go with that philosophy and then you'll learn a lot. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to tell you that very few people know is this. That what separates all the gunk, all that stuff in your, in your gut from your bloodstream. Remember, all the, all the food particles that are digested in your gut have to enter your bloodstream, right? Or else. Now what separates, you know what the barrier is? One cell, one cell separates all those particles in your gut from your bloodstream. You know, when I was in histology class way back, I thought that was amazing. One cell, I thought it would be like a big barrier. Like there would be tons of stuff. And it's one cell. If that breaks down, you get into a lot of trouble. And we can break it down with bad digestion. Then you can develop autoimmune disease. You can develop actually osteoarthritis. You can develop rheumatoid arthritis. You can develop eczema. You can develop diabetes because of the breakdown of this barrier. And I'm going to show you how that happens as we progress through the lecture.
Well, that's a lot of lecture already. It is, right? And I've only gone through three slides. I have 63 slides. I think I better stop here. <laughs> stop talking. Just get through this. <laughs> okay. Causes, why do we have digestive disturbance? So one of the things is our diet. So I'm not going to go into diet because you guys have heard it a million times. So I'm not going to repeat things. But I'm going to give you a, a little additive to this. The thing I will tell you, I will add to this, is sugar. Sugar is a big, big problem. I know you've heard about it, and you think it's just because it can cause diabetes, but no, no, it's all sorts of other things that it does. And let me give you an example about why sugar is so detrimental. First, the average American. You know how much the average American consumes in sugar? 20 pounds. Do I hear 30 pounds? Do I hear 40 back there? 40 back there in the red shirt, 40 back there. <laughs> <laughs> the average American consumes 200 pounds of sugar a year. 200 pounds. Mamma mia. That's my Italian coming out. They consume 150 pounds of white sugar and 50 pounds of high fructose corn syrup. That's 200 pounds. Now, what's the problem with that? Because sugar tastes really good. I like the taste of it. I know it's shocking. I know it shocks a lot of people. This is what the problem with sugar is. The problem with sugar is something called glycation glycation the ability of sugar to stick to things think about this when you when you drink a can of pop and you pick it up the next day that pop can is very sticky why because sugar is a glue you use it to starch collars as well it's a glue so what happens in the body it starts to stick to things it sticks to your proteins like for example proteins are the enzymes enzymes that make things function better so it slows them down it sticks to your white blood cells they can't function normally anymore it sticks to microtubules microtubules are a part of the are a part of the way that your your cells actually separate and divide it can impede those and the end result is something we call AGEs advanced glycation end products it's what happens when sugar sticks around your blood for a long long time and those advanced glycation end products the AGEs are the ones that call cause peripheral neuropathies they cause angiopathies they cause damage to the blood vessels the the ability of blood to flow throughout the body is impeded because the elasticity is gone because everything sticks together and hardens up Everybody get that? And how is that? Because, think about, you know, uh, this, nobody will, nobody will answer this question. I know it. Actually, two people did answer, but, but they, that's because they had come to a previous lecture. How many miles of blood vessels do you think you have in your body? How many miles of blood vessels do you think, how much? 8,000 miles. How much? A hundred thousand. This guy's pretty close. Sixty thousand miles of blood vessels in your body. Sixty thousand. Think about that. A thousand. A mile is five thousand feet. So what does that tell you about your circulation? Sixty tells me that the majority of my circulation is the microcirculation, the microscopic little capillaries that feed every single cell of your body. You can't even see them. Now, when your, blood, when your heart pumps at 120 millimeters of mercury, there is no way that that pressure can propel blood to 60,000 miles. It's impossible. The reason why it propels it is because the blood vessels dilate and contract because of the elasticity. When you glycate those products, when you glycate those little blood vessels, they don't have elasticity, so perfusion becomes difficult. This is why diabetics have a lot of leg ulcers. Sometimes they got to get their foot amputated or their toes amputated because blood flow is impeded. Glycation creates those problems. Sugar creates those problems, and sugar will create digestive problems as well. That's my diet spiel because I can't go into everything, but I can go into that. So you really got to start curbing or start to learn how we can control sugar consumption. It's not easy. Hey, listen, I remember I was, I was the kid. Remember when I was a kid, Kool-Aid, one tea bag with two cups of sugar, and mix it up and you drink it. I thought that was good for me. It was on TV. That's not good for you. And so things have changed. We're learning a lot, but we need to curb it. We need to cut back. So, for example, if you're going to put three teaspoons of sugar in your coffee, cut it back to one and a half, then go down to one, and you'll find that your palate will adjust to it. 
You know, my sister, she used to put six, six teaspoons of sugar in, in, in her coffee. Six. Oh, I go, this is not good for you. She goes, but it, does, it tastes bitter. And so slowly I cut her back, and eventually she got to the one. But you can do it. It takes a little bit of time. You can also sometimes mix it with a little bit of stevia. You, you, could, do, you could play around with it to try to reduce it. Okay. I just put this up. Uh, actually, this is Michael Murray gave me these slides. These are, look, look how things have changed caloric-wise. Look at this one. Popcorn. Large popcorn used to be 174 calories. That's 1,700 calories. That's a big shift in the way we eat. Everything is much bigger. Much bigger is causing more and more problems. The, the, the population, we, the, the statistics show that about 40% of the population has digestive problems. I can tell you right now, that number is way higher. I, can, I guarantee you that if I said, how many of you in this audience have had digestive problems? How many of you in this audience have had diarrhea, constipation, heartburn, gas, bloating? Everybody's going to put up their hand. <laughs> Everybody at one time or other has had a digestive problem. It's everybody. And what happens is digestive problems, impaired digestion long term will lead to chronic fatigue syndrome. They could lead to arthritis. They could lead to diabetes. They could lead to eczema. They could lead even to cancer. They could lead to lots of stuff. And everybody always asks me, how is that possible? And I say, oh, that's very possible. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share with you how that's possible in one sec. I will show you how this happens. But first, I've got to show you how you digest. <laughs> so I've got to go from the mouth all the way down. You know what I'm saying? We've got to start from the top, go down. So the first place is in the mouth. And actually, the mouth produces an enzyme called amylase. You know how you can test it? Take a little piece of bread, chew it for about 15 minutes, and you'll see that that bread becomes very sweet. Why? Because the amylase, an enzyme, is breaking down the bread into sugars. Because bread is made up, it's a complex carbohydrate, but you break it down, and it has sugars. And you'll see that that bread becomes very, very sweet. Once that's done, once after you chewed your food, it's going to go into the stomach. So let's stop here. The stomach is an interesting system because it's very muscular. And it's like a, bl a blender. It churns things. And one of the things that the stomach does, it shoots acid into the food. Because you always heard of acid indigestion from the stomach, right? And do you know what the pH of the stomach is when you, th this evening when you had your meal, you know what the pH of the stomach was? Or still is? It's between 1.2 and 2. Your pH is between 1.2 and 2 in your stomach when you eat. And think about that. The pH range goes from a, a 1 to 14. 7 is water. 1 is very acidic. Your stomach is so acidy when you eat that it could put a hole in your hand. Your stomach acid is so strong when you eat that it can dissolve a nail. So you, that shocks you, right? Because you're probably thinking to yourself, wait a minute, how come I don't have a hole in my stomach, right? Right? right. That's the question. Exactly. That's a very good question. Uh, that's what I always do. I always ask questions. Wait a minute, 1.2 dissolve, but now how come I don't have a hole in my stomach? That's a very good question. The reason you don't have a hole in your stomach is because your stomach produces something called mucin. It's a mucus. It coats the lining of your stomach, and all of a sudden, the acid gets neutralized when it hits the stomach wall. You follow that? produces mucin. Therefore, if you develop an ulcer, you get burning. Why? Because the mucin is being eroded. That's why we take this product here. This is one of my favorite products. It's called DGL. And this works, I've been using this for 24 years now. So what you do is, you chew it. You chew two tablets 15 minutes before your meal, and within 15 minutes, mucin will be stimulated in your stomach if your stomach is not producing mucin. And that mucin will coat your stomach and protect you from that acid. Because that acid has to be there. Why does the acid, why does your stomach produce an acid of 1.2 to 2? Why? For what possible purpose? I'm glad you asked the question. It's a very good question. The reason is to annihilate everything. It kills everything. It will kill all the bacteria, all the viruses, all the parasites, all the, all the, everything that you can think of, it will annihilate it. It's an annihilator. It neutralizes everything, so none of that stuff can get to the lower gut. So you don't get food poisoning. You don't get E. coli. Everybody follow that? The second reason why your pH of your stomach is 1.2 to 2 is to break down proteins. It's a protein breakdowner. <laughs> 
it breaks down your proteins. That's the second reason. And the third reason, and there's probably a whole bunch of other ones, but I only know three of them. <laughs> the third reason is to stimulate the production of something we call intrinsic factor. What intrinsic factor is, you've heard of B12. In order for you to absorb B12, you need intrinsic factor. Therefore, your stomach is not producing intrinsic factor, you're going to become B12 deficient. So see how important acid in your stomach is? And what do we prescribe all the time? Antacids. This causes a lot of problems. So the pH of the stomach has to be acidic for those three reasons that I just mentioned. The first one is pretty important. To annihilate everything. So the food gets down there, you don't have any of these bad bacteria or bad viruses or bad parasites. Once all that's done, it becomes this thing we call chyme. Then it's going to go into the duodenum. And the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. It's about 12 finger lengths, about that long. And there, from the pancreas, it's going to shoot enzymes in. Amylases, proteases, lipases will all get infiltrated into the duodenum and mix in with the food. These things break down proteins, they break down fats, and they break down the carbohydrates. Then bile, you heard of bile, right? The gallbladder will squeeze, and the liver will push bile into the duodenum, mix in. Why? Because you need bile in order to absorb fat and in order to get rid of toxins from the liver. So the bile actually carries chemical toxins. So when you're taking enzymes, this is where the enzymes are going to go in the duodenum. So if you're going to take like a, a, a complete chest, or if you're going to take a megazyme, where's the megazyme? It's somewhere here. Those, are, those enzymes will end up in the duodenum helping you break down those foods. Because this is where a lot of digestion actually happens, mixing in with the enzymes. And also, the duodenum is where your minerals get absorbed, your calcium, your magnesium, your potassium. So if you're not absorbing minerals, this is where it's happening. So if this is not acidic enough, it's not going to be able to absorb those minerals. Once that's done, then it's going to enter the small intestine. The rest of the, which is, which is made up of the jejunum and the ileum. The jejunum is where water-soluble compounds will be absorbed into the blood. And the ileum is where fat-soluble things will be absorbed into the blood. Once that's done, it's going to go through this little area. There's an area called the ileocecal valve that separates your large intestine from your small intestine. And when it enters the large intestine, also called the colon, the function of the colon is to absorb water. Your colon absorbs between two to three liters of water per day. Now, when your colon can't absorb water, what do you get? No. The opposite. So think about this. The, 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 the mush that's left from the small intestine, it's very liquidy. It's very, so what do you get? So when the colon can't absorb water, that's when you get diarrhea. The reason you get diarrhea is because the colon cannot absorb water. That's its function. So you get all the liquidy stool from the small intestine. That's what diarrhea is. An inability of your colon to absorb water. And why does it have an inability to absorb water? Because other bacteria have entered it. They're interfering with the function of those bacteria, which we'll learn about in a little bit. When all the water's absorbed, and there's absolutely no water left in the colon, because you didn't take enough fiber. See, I, I eat lots of fiber every day, as the girls back there see, right? Those 12-gram bars. <laughs> and I got to help with the 14-gram bar. <laughs> so, wh so what fiber does, holds on to water, so now some water remains in the colon. Therefore, you get more softer stool. Because if all the water's gone, you get constipated. So that's it. That's constipation and diarrhea in a nutshell. <laughs> everybody get that? You know why I always tell everybody, does everybody get this? Does everybody get How many times have I repeated the same thing over and over? You know why? Because when I was in university, this genetic professor was talking, and I couldn't understand what the heck the guy was talking about. So I looked around the class, and nobody put up their hand. So I go, am I the only guy that doesn't know what this guy's talking about? So I didn't want to put up my hand. I was embarrassed. So then I went to my friend Eugene. I go, Eugene. What's this guy talking to me? He goes, I don't know. I go, you don't know? I go, why don't you put up your hand? He goes, well, why don't you put up your hand? And then I go, I bet you everybody in the class doesn't know what he's talking about. So you know what I did? In the next two days, I asked everybody in the class. Nobody knew what he was talking about. So then I went to see this professor. I go, listen, I got a, I got a problem. I go, I don't understand what you're talking about in this class. And I go, and the, and the rest of the class doesn't understand either. 
He goes, oh, he goes, I don't blame. He goes, I don't understand what I'm talking about myself. I go, you don't understand what you're talking about yourself? I wait. He goes, I don't want to teach this class. They're forcing me. He was a researcher, and they had forced him to teach the class. He hated teaching. And so I learned from that experience that had the psychological impact on my brain. <laughs> because I said, when I ever teach, because that's what I like doing, teaching. That's why I do this, because I love it. <laughs> I'm as excited to do this now as I was 23 years ago. I never get bored of it. <laughs> it's, it's the funnest thing I do is this kind of interaction with, with crowds and with patients. And so I always wanted to teach the way I like to learn. So the way that I tell you guys things is the way I learn the stuff. And so, because I figure that if I can learn it that way, anybody can learn it that way. So that's why I share this knowledge with you in this kind of fashion. Anyways, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, does everybody get it? <laughs> and then what happens, once all that's done, then it goes into the great porcelain ocean. That's the, that's the waste products that are left. So there's lots of things that can go wrong in here. When things go wrong, we can get a lot of systemic problems. So this is what it looks like in paradigestion. So what happens is, in paradigestion is when you can't break down foods. Where you might not have enough acid. Where your enzymes aren't functioning. Now what happens, you're going to get these proteins that aren't getting broken down. Some of the carbohydrates aren't going to get broken down. And what's going to happen is, when they get to the lower gut, bacteria start acting on it, and they start producing these compounds, scatols, indoles, formaldehyde, and they offset the pH of the lower gut. When they offset that pH, you can get the proliferation of other bacteria. Proliferation means that you always have yeast in your body. You just keep it in check. And so it gives them an opportunity to proliferate, and they start to grow. And when they start to grow, remember that one that one cell layer, that can get damaged. And when that gets damaged, you can get increased gut permeability, also known as leaky gut, which will cause autoimmune conditions to begin. And that's how you get chronic disease. And the way that it looks, it looks something like this. Okay. Remember I told you, this is the small intestine. And this, see this is, each one of these are cells. They're actually epithelial cells, if you want the full name. And these epithelial cells separate everything in your gut, your small intestine, from your blood. This is your blood over here. Now this is a paradox. Why is it a paradox? Because this layer has to be porous enough to allow food particles or nutrients to get into your blood, yet strong enough to stop things from getting inside your blood that you don't want to get inside your blood. So it's a paradox. So what happens is, when you get bad digestion, you will get damage to that layer. Those cells can get damaged. They can start breaking down. This is what gluten does as well, if you're allergic to gluten. It starts eating away and creating these holes, these holes into the, these epithelial cells, and all of a sudden, large food particles we call antigens that are not supposed to get into your blood, all of a sudden they get inside your blood. And when they get inside your blood, your blood says, uh-oh, uh-oh, we have an attacker, we have an attacker, send out, the, send out the police people, send out the police people. So what happens is, an alarm rings in your immune system. The alarm goes to the police station, and the police station send out the police people. The police people are also called antibodies. Anybody heard of antibodies? And the antibodies will attack this particle. But sometimes, that particle looks like your body's own tissues. So not only does it attack that, but it attacks your own tissues. For example, in this particular case, it's attacking your knee joint, so now you've got arthritis. It can attack your skin, and you can develop eczema. It can attack your nervous system, you can develop neurological disorder. Everybody follow so far? Sure. And it's like this. Let me give you a further easier example. The roof on your house is like that lining. The inside of the house, under the roof, is all your body parts. Your sofa is your skin. Your television is your eyes. Your furnace is your lungs. <laughs> now, think about this. You got holes on the roof of the house. And it's raining. The water seeps in and lands on the sofa because that's where the hole is. All of a sudden, what do you got? You got mold on your sofa. That's like eczema. Now another house. Holes in the house, it goes on the television set. Now the television says short circuits and you can't see television. Now you, you have eye problems. Everybody follow? That's how it happens. It can, go in the, it can go in the hinges of the door, and all of a sudden the door rusts. That's like arthritis. And that's what happens systemically. That's why gut problems can lead to systemic problems. Do you have a question? 
Can they lead to seizures? It could. I'm a, you know I'm a seizure expert. Eh? You know I wrote a big chapter. I, I wrote a whole thing on, 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 the, on the latest textbook of natural medicine. My chapter is on seizures, on how seizures are formed. I can, I can tell you lots. I'll, 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 I can tell you lots about seizures. But it could contribute to it. One of the contributing factors to seizures is actually hypoglycemia, low blood sugar can cause because it'll create membrane instability in those little cells, in the, in, the, in the little neurons in the brain, and those will cause lots of firing, which will cause the seizure. But I, I, can, I, can, I can share that with you. But it can cause all sorts of problems. Drugs. You know, I'll give you, drugs can cause that as well. Drugs. Drugs right, yes. I'll tell you, now, uh, let, me, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example of one of my patients. Comes in, patient, 34-year-old female, came into my clinic with chronic eczema of the hands. They, they, the, the eczema was so bad that she had to wear gloves. Now, five years ago, she had, she had developed the eczema, and she went to see a dermatologist. The dermatologist gave her topical steroids, which really helped, 1% cortisone helped for a bit for six months and after six months it came back so she put it on again and it wasn't working as effective so that she, he gave her oral uh, pregnisone so it started five milligrams went up to 10 15 20 25 milligrams work got rid of the eczema it lasted a year she went back he gave her the same routine again went back the third time and he said you know what I don't think I'm going to give you it's it just has too many consequences why don't you go see Morello so they send them to me so when she came to me I started doing a, a, a research on her past history, and what I found was that six years previous to that, she had developed GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. And GERD, she was prescribed Zantac. What is Zantac? Zantac is an H2 antagonist. It stops hydrochloric acid. What happens when you alkalize the stomach? All of a sudden, now you can't kill all the bugs anymore. So what happens those bugs get to the lower gut? And what's going to happen to the lower gut? It's going to mess up the whole gut system. And what's going to happen? They're going to start damaging those epithelial cells. You're going to put holes in the roof. And when you put holes in the roof, what's going to happen? The water's going to go down. It's going to go on the sofa. And she's going to develop eczema. So anyway, so this, I gave her this program. I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you DGL. I'm going to give you some enzymes. I'm going to give you some probiotics. I'm going to give you some good fish oils. She, and I go, this is going to help with your stomach. She goes, but my stomach is not the problem. It's my skin. So that's where I gave her the analogy of the roof. And this patient took her off the Zantec. This patient, within 30 days, was 50% improved, and within two months, it was all gone. Isn't that cool medicine? I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, see, that's real. See, because you're finding the root cause of the problem. That's what you got to find. What is the cause of the problem? Not just cover it up. You can't cover it up. You know, I had a dream once. I'm even going to share dreams with you. So my <laughs> this dream, I can't even tell you when I had this dream. This dream happened in 1992. And so I dreamt of medicine. And I remember there's, I live in Vancouver, and, and there was a very famous ski mountain in Vancouver. It's called Whistler. So to get to Whistler from Vancouver, you've got to go around this torturous highway, and it's right on the edge of cliffs. And at the cliffs, as you go into some of these, you know, these big heavy turns, it says, slow down to 10 miles an hour. But what happens? People still go 30 or 40, and they flip right off the, uh, off the cliff, go down to the bottom, and then the ambulance comes with the trucks, and you know, the ropes, and they got to pull everything down, and then helicopter them into the hospital. So what medicine did is, they put a hospital at the bottom of the cliff. <laughs> now they fall down right there. You're right in there. You don't have to do anything. They can crawl over. So this is what we kind of done. Instead of drilling a hole right through the, that cliff, so you put a tunnel in, so you avoid that turn, because nobody's going to slow down. And so this was my dream of medicine in 1992. I, this is how much I've been thinking about this stuff. <laughs> I live it, breathe it, touch it, feel it. <laughs> I can't stop learning more about it. Anyways, so that's what we kind of done. And it doesn't, it's not, it's only short term. It's, a sh it's their short term. We don't do, we haven't done very much with the chronic conditions. We do very well with emergency conditions. You know, like uh, uh, my father, my, you know, I was, I was going, this is about, Five weeks ago, I was, I was going to the airport. I had to, I had to do a, a, a training uh, for, for some doctors. And uh, my mother calls me. She goes, your father had a fever all night. I go, fever all night? I go, oh, he probably has the flu, maybe. <laughs> and she goes, well, he goes, he was sweating. He was shaking. I go, okay. And she goes, and his foot was a little bit red. I go, his foot is a little bit red. Is it swollen? She goes, well, just a little bit. I go, look for a cut on the foot. Can you find a cut on the foot? Uh, and she looks. She goes, no, there was no cut. I go, you sure? Yep, there's no cut. I go, okay, well, I go, go see Dr. Salvino, because I was, I was leaving out of town. But then I called my sister immediately. I go, Angela, go to the house, go check his foot, see if you can find a cut. 
I go look between the toes because mom's eyes aren't that great. So she went, she found a cut in the toe. So what, what, you know what's going to happen when you get a cut in the toe? My dad goes swimming all the time. Cellulitis. A man who's 80 years old that has fever and a cut in the toe with a swollen foot is bound to have cellulitis. I go, I go, go bypass everything. He's going to the hospital. He needs IV antibiotics. And he developed full-blown cellulitis. And cellulitis is a, is a, a staph infection of the foot, which is very serious. You've got to treat it with antibiotics immediately. See, there's medicine treating an acute condition. That's when you need it. If that's not a chronic condition. That's an acute condition caused by what? By cutting the foot, caused by what? He's been swimming because he's been exercising in the pool. And the pool has chlorine that kills all the bacteria on the outside. And sometimes when you're in those public pools, you can develop athlete's foot if you don't spray the feet all the time. And that could cause a crack in the skin, which will allow bacteria around the pool to get inside. And that's how you develop cellulose. So you've got to always be careful about those things about the feet. Okay, now, what do we do? What do we do is we, use, we can use probiotics, enzymes, and DGL. DGL is a great product. Are you starving? Yeah, most people are starving. There's a couple of enzymes that I find work very efficaciously. One of them is called Megazyme. This is a pancreatic extract. And this enzyme, this is another one I've been using for over 20 years. And you can take two tablets. This one you've got to take right before you eat because it's got to bypass the stomach and get into the duodenum. Okay, so this is a pancreatic extract, very, very effective in helping you break down your foods. And this enzyme is also mimics your own body's enzymes as well. Another enzyme that's excellent is called Complete Just. This is a full plant enzyme. This one you don't have to take before your meal. You can take with your meal because it's not sensitive to stomach acid. So you take, and the way that you take this is make sure you dose properly. When a patient comes in and they're bloating, they got gas, they got all sorts of issues, they may have, you know, leaky gut, I make sure I start with at least three of these with the meal. And then what they do is they have to text me back the same day. Text me back. I want to know what happened. And you know what? Sometimes they text me back and said, that enzyme that you gave me didn't do not diddly squat. So I go, oh, that's why I make you text me back because I want to hear it. And what does diddly squat mean? It means they never felt any different. So I said, okay, now go up to five. Sometimes you have to go up to six. And then they text me back and go, wow, that worked. But if I would have left them by themselves and they would have taken that, they would have said, this stuff doesn't work. Dosing is important. So always don't give up on something because you might be on the wrong dose. And you could take, you could take six of these, no problem. Take them with your meal and you should feel lighter after you take it. Okay, licorice to the root. DGL stands for darn good licorice. No. It stands for deglycerizinated licorice. So what they've taken, they've taken the glycerinic acid out of the licorice because licorice has a cortisol effect. So it can lift up your adrenal glands. So too much of that can elevate your blood pressure. So they've taken that out. So the way that you take this is you chew three, two to three tablets right before, 50 minutes before your meal. And they're, you know, they, I think they got some samples for you. And these things are just awesome. They taste fantastic. You just chew them. So you take it, that's it. It tastes fantastic. A lot, a lot of people don't like licorice. This, this is a chocolate flavor one, and you don't taste any licorice on it. And that will stimulate mucin in my stomach within 15 minutes. Yeah, I've been using these forever. And these enzymatic therapy ones are definitely the best on the market. You can try whatever you want. Nothing works as, as effective as these. And I want to show you a study that was done Here's a study on ulcers. Remember I told you one of the reasons you develop ulcers is because if you shed the coat, that mucin layer, your, your, your epithelial cells are exposed to the acid and they can burn it. Well, here is 12-week clinical trial with endoscopy. Endoscopy is the use of a camera to see the ulcer. And what they did was they used antacids, cementidine, which is tagamet or uh, much like Zantac, Garfernet and DGL. These are the number of patients. And look at the healing. DGL was as effective as the medications in healing ulcers, yet it had nothing to do with the acid. It didn't touch the acid. The other ones reduced acid production. So you can improve, you can improve stomach ulcers without touching the acid by just stimulating mucin production. The enzymes, I would recommend everybody take them. Like I also recommend that everybody take probiotics. 
Bacteria are really good for you. You know that when you're born, when you're going through the vaginal canal during birth, you pick up 300 different types of bacteria just through that. And those are the, that's the implantation that begins right at the beginning. The implantation begins there. Now think about if you were born through Caesar section, through a C-section, you're not going to get those 300. You're going to get something else. It's interesting how that can change. And those will become your fingerprint of your microbiota. The microbiota of your gut is a fingerprint. Now one of the things that we did learn is when, when they did this one study, which is an interesting study. They, they actually measured the entirety of the microbiota of these humans, six different uh, patients. So they checked and they measured how many types of bacteria they had, the, the whole count. Then what they did was they gave those patients Cipro. Cipro is a very strong antibiotic. And they gave Cipro for three days. And then they remeasured the microbiota. You know what? Those people never got back to normal. It changed the bacteria for good. Which is really interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, how many people are going on antibiotics and their bacteria, their bacteria in the gut never comes back? So this is where you need to really supplement with probiotics. Probiotics have, you know, if you go on PubMed, PubMed is the research engine of science. When you go on there and you type up probiotics, you'll see thousands of articles from 2012. It, the science in it is just exploding. So it's a, it's a, it's a really, really fascinating aspect. When you look at probiotic package, you'll always see, when you, when you pick up one of these things, you'll always see like lactobacilli. Then you'll see bifidobacter. So always make sure that they have lactobacilli and bifidobacter. Lactobacilli reside in the small intestine, bifidobacter are for the large intestine. So you want to make sure that you have each one of these. And there's going to be a whole bunch of different names. Like the genus would be the lactobacilli. So it would be lactobacilli is the genus. And then the species will be acidophilus. So you, you will see lactobacillus acidophilus. Then you will see, sometimes you'll have strain. You don't have to worry about strain, but strain is another designation. So they could be lactobacillus acidophilus B536. That's just a strain. But what you really try to focus on the, the, the genus and the, uh, and the species. As we go down the stomach, uh, as we go down the intestinal tract, the lower we go and the more bacteria we find. So for example, the stomach has very few bacteria. Why? Because of the acid. But when we get into the colon, it's like a trillion bacteria per mil. Like just these huge numbers. Lower down you go and the more bacteria. Bacteria play a critical, critical role in their health. What do they do? Well, they do lots of things. One. When you analyze what these things do, one of the things that bacteria do in your gut, they produce bacteriocins. Bacteriocins are actually antibiotics that kill bad bugs. These little bacteria in your gut actually produce B-complex vitamins. They're producing vitamins in your gut to help you. They produce vitamin K, one of the aquatic vitamins, and also a vitamin that's important for, for the buildup of bone tissue. Vitamin K is produced by these bacteria. These bacteria produce enzymes that help you break down foods. Like for example, they actually produce lactase, which breaks down lactose. These bacteria will digest fibers in the colon. And by digesting these fibers, they produce short-chain fatty acids, which have anti-cancer properties, but also play a critical role in water regulation in the colon. Remember the colon? What does it do? Absorbs two to three liters of water a day. And when does that get interfere with? When some other bacteria come in there and mess that stuff up, and then you get diarrhea. Like C. difficile, like Montezuma's Revenge, all these kinds of bacteria that can come in there. So it creates, these bacteria control water regulation in the colon. These bacteria, we've learned, communicate with white blood cells, giving them information about what's coming, about what to do, what kind of immune cells to stimulate. There's a lot of stuff going on that you would never imagine. These bacteria produce mucus that protects those layers of cells from getting holes in them. They protect the roof from getting holes so water can't come inside. And this has all been proven over and over again. We're finding these bacteria now actually have a process where they actually affect lipogenic enzymes that are important for metabolism. That's pretty interesting, eh? So you know what they did? They, they took genetically obese rats. 
rats were always overweight. And they took their microbiota and then they inoculated neutral rats that had no bacteria. You know what happened to those neutral rats? They all became obese. Then they took genetically lean rats and they isolated the microbiota, they took those bacteria and they inoculated neutral rats and those neutral rats became thin. Wow. This is all like, this is all stuff that's coming out now. Fascinating, fascinating aspects of gastroenterology to do with the bacteria in your gut that play such a significant role in the who we are and what we become and what kind of diseases and conditions we contract. So think about all the stuff that we stick in here. <laughs> Have you ever noticed when you take an antibiotic, sometimes you develop a yeast infection because you're killing good bacteria. Those bacteria are critical. They're not foes, they're actually friends. So we need these bacteria and we have to do everything to keep them healthy. Here's a, well, the reason why I have this picture is, here's, for example, here's the, that one cell lining that we were talking about. This is inside the gut. This is the bloodstream. Here's a dendritic cell. This is an immune cell. Look, the bacteria inside your gut will communicate with the tail, give it information, this will be transmitted to these other cells, and all sorts of immune functions occur because of it. That's how detailed the communication is. It's incredible what these things do. So taking probiotics daily becomes a pretty, pretty important thing. This is a, a list of different types of lactobacillus. Remember I said there's lactobacillus and bifidobacter. And within the lactobacillus genus, there's all sorts of species. Bulgaris, Brevi, Casei, Fermentum, Johnsoni, Salvarius. And look, they all do all sorts of, look, Acid, lactobacillus acidophilus stimulates hydrogen peroxide, lactosidin, acetophilin, B vitamin A, bulgaris, immune function, L brevis, vitamin K and vitamin D. So you see that the idea here is that they do different things, some of them. They all have similarities, but they do have other modes of activity which are beneficial. And same with the bifidobacter. Remember, bifidobacter occupy the, the large intestine. So one of the things I would recommend is take a probiotic daily. I got involved with the pearls a long time ago. I'll tell you my story. You know, I have a story for everything. Eh? <laughs> everything, I got a story. But you know what? When you're stories, you remember. And the story of this pearl happened about 10 years ago. And I had these philanthropists that came into my clinic. And uh, they, they go to these third world countries. And, you know, and, they, and they work with the people in the third world. Which, they do good things. They give their money away, which is great. And, uh, and they didn't give me their money, but you know, they, give, they give the money away, which they're, they're, they're doing good deeds. And one of the problems they had was that they developed diarrhea when they go to these, uh, these, these countries. And one of the things that they always took was antibiotics with them. So they came to see me because they didn't want to take antibiotics. So they said, you know, what not? So, you know, obviously probiotics. And at that time, this was the only room temperature stable probiotic that was around. Because most of them you got to keep in the refrigerator, and that's why I started using it, because... It was room temperature stable and because they travel and they're out. So you needed something that didn't die off because the refrigerated ones did. So I started giving them these and I, I recommended this, this particular brand. I recommended four of these. Other, and you know what? These people never developed diarrhea anymore. And then I started getting hundreds of philanthropists coming to my clinic for help. <laughs> and I go, just go to help us and buy some, some of these pearls. They work. And this pearl, like, you know, I belong to the Quality Assurance Committee. In, in, uh, in, in, in my province of British Columbia. So we actually analyze things. And when we analyze these probiotics, because it says 1 billion CFU count, this actually has between 4 to 7 billion. So it's a, yeah, it's a much higher dose than what's on the label. And I've, you know, I've been, we've been measuring it for years, and it always comes out much, much higher. Because a lot of probiotics, the, the actual count is higher because they, they try to count for die-off. But these things are very, very vibrant. This is a great... Uh, the, the strain in here, the Lactobacillus acidophilus, is a B536, and it has over 60 different studies. It's very, very effective. This is something that will really, really help you. Uh, something you can take for on a daily, daily basis. It's very effective. And that's how I, got a, that's how I learned about, about the, the pearl technology. Um, and so this is the pearl. Uh, what's unique about the pearl is it's room temperature stable, and it bypasses the stomach acid. Remember the stomach acid, 1.2 1, 1. to 2? It'll kill anything. So you want to always make sure that these things are protected so they can get to the lower bowel.
Another line is the Fortify line um, and the uh, uh, the Primadophilus line. This is a pretty extensive line of Nature's Way probiotics, and I think you got some information on it. And what they what they have is they have a real selection of strains. They have lots of different strains that have lots of different effects. And we have they have the 35 billion, the 60 billion, and the 100 billion. So notice as CFUs they keep increasing. And one of the problems is that everybody's confused. Which one do I take? Yeah, I have a billion, I have five billion, ten billion. Do I hear 30? Do I hear 60? Do I have 100? Now I have 200 billion. Which one really do I need? And it, I can't imagine how confusing this must be. And lucky you guys have stores like this where they're all educated because imagine out there where they don't have this kind of environment. So let me give you a, a, a brief kind of overview of this and where you use these from my experience from clinic and everything I tell you that means I've seen it over and over again in my clinical environment that way I can talk about it and so the majority of people do very very easily like somebody who's healthy they do real real easy with the pearl selection very easy 5 billion 10 billion real easy everybody can tolerate them and so if you're pretty healthy those are the ones you want to take as you get more illness say that you have a disorder of the gut you might want to start taking like a 35 billion if it's something light so boof it up to a 35 billion and see how you do take one capsule and see the reactions you have how does your body react to that as the condition gets worse if you have like an ulcerative colitis you're gonna have to go to a 60 billion if you've been on IV antibiotics you gotta go to a hundred billion you see that because you've destroyed a lot so you need to repopulate that zone with higher counts and more bigger more strains the pearls have a couple two or three four strains so you want to have more strains in it so you go to the higher amount and also you have to take it to feel how that feels on you because all, all of us are very unique in our in our ways and people can react differently so I've seen all sorts of interesting reactions <laughs> so you really gotta you gotta really try these things out and once you get something that's comfortable then keep taking it probiotics are good to take daily on my trips, you know, one of the things I did that test for, when I fly from Vancouver to the East Coast, that's a five-hour flight, when I get on the plane and I get off, I'm already developing gas. Have you ever, anybody noticed that? <laughs> you develop gas right away. Just, what is it? The air that I'm breathing? It's already changing and affecting my gut. And then when I take probiotics, it, it, no, 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 no problem. So, for example, on this trip, I flew this morning from Vancouver. I got up, uh, let's see, uh, no, I, I got up out of my bed at 2 a.m. in the morning. I was ready by 4, I drove to the airport one hour <laughs> and caught the 6 o'clock flight to come here. Probiotics, no gas. See, good. Probiotics are pretty important to take. They really, really affect. Uh, these ones have to be refrigerated. Yeah, these are refrigerated ones. The prima dolphins have to be refrigerated. Yes. Great probiotics. They're human strains. Those are the ones you want. Remember I told you therapeutics. Remember I told you the human... Uh, do, do you remember I told you at the beginning of the lecture about taking, uh, uh, isolating the, uh, the, the microbiota out of the husband and inoculating the, the, the wife? And it, you know what they call that technology? Therapeutics. Therapeutics. And it works. Human strains. Human strains are very important. These are all human strains. Okay, now I've got to move on to detoxification. So, okay, we're all toxic. That's it. And you've got to clean it up. <laughs> They actually, there's lots of stuff that's coming out about toxicities. We have over 85,000 registered chemicals with the Environmental Protection Agency. Statistics show that you have about 700 chemicals in your body at any given time, which is a bunch of BS. You have over 40,000, I can guarantee you. You have thousands and thousands of chemicals that are in your systems right now. All sorts of chemicals. Now, there was a, a, a great article, which I'm happy that they put on, because I've been, it's in my book. Remember, this book I wrote four years ago, and four years ago, I was talking about this subject that was in the New York Times this week. <laughs> and the subject was that toxic chemicals are playing a big role in the obesity epidemic. And what they did was, the New York Times had a great article on this, where they looked at, they actually fed, they took... Two sets of rats, same weight, same everything, same diet, nothing changed. The only thing that changed, one set of rats was giving a tiny amount of one of these chemicals you all have, endocrine disruptor. A little minute amount. Guess what happened to that rat? All those rats were all obese. What these chemicals are doing, and now what we're calling these chemicals, they've even called them now, 
obesogens. Obesogens are chemicals that affect certain parts of your DNA that regulate metabolism and they're impacting it. You will hear more and more about this as time progresses. But you're hearing more. It, there's lots out there. The, the, the real person, it's not, I'm not the person that invented this. The real person that really is responsible for this knowledge was an article I read, Bale Hamilton. B-A-I-L-L-E Hamilton. She really, this paper that she put out really opened, it was a landmark paper that actually connected chemical, introduction of chemicals with the obesity epidemic. That there's a big, big link from these two things. And do chemicals have an impact on what we look like and what we become? Darn right. Does the environment have an impact on who we become? Yes. Does genetics? Not as much as the environment. We are what we eat, drink, breathe, touch, and can eliminate. And here is an article. Uh, this picture I've been showing for since I got it. I got it in 2006. I have a story for this picture too if you want to really know. <laughs> This story was, this was on my honeymoon. <laughs> on my honeymoon, so we're flying out, and I'm, I'm not allowed to bring a Blackberry, a computer, nothing. But at the airport, I was allowed to buy Discover Magazine. And that's where this appeared. 2006, November issue, Discover Magazine. What is it? It's a picture of two guys. One guy's six foot one, the other guy's five foot ten. Here's back view, front view, side view. Obviously, this one, he's a large frame, and he's a medium frame. Two different guys. You know, what, you know what's fascinating about those two guys? They're identical twins. Their DNA is exactly the same. There is no difference in their DNA. How do they become... This, this is why they're photographed. Identical twins becoming that, having that differential with differentiating diseases. So what happened to them? Right? You want to know, right? I know you want to know, but I'm not going to tell you. The, the lecture's over. <laughs> so what happened to them was they were separated at birth and they grew up in two different environments. The foods they ate, the water they drank, what they were exposed to, their nurturing was different. That differential changed the way their DNA behaved. And to make you understand or to really clarify what genetics looks like, I can teach it a lot better than my professor did. The genome is the 23 pairs of chromosomes that are found in every single cell of your body. That's how you're able to make your hair, your skin, your saliva, all the... That's why we can take saliva and we can do a DNA test. We can take blood, we can do a DNA test. We can take skin, we can do a DNA test. We can take hair and we can do a DNA test because all 23 pairs of chromosomes are found in every single cell of your body. That is the textbook on how to make you. That's what that is. It's the textbook. Now you all heard of chromosomes, right? The chromosomes are the chapters in the textbook on how to make you. That's what chromosomes are. The chapters. And you all heard of genes, right? The genes are the sections in the chapters. So you have 23 chapters with sections in each chapter which are the genes. Now, for what happened to the twins? Well, I'm glad you asked. In section, in chapter 19, section 265, when you read, when you go to that page, it says, thou shalt be six foot one. Now what happens if that page, all of a sudden there's something spills on it, like ink, and you can't read it? It says, thou shalt be ink stained. <laughs> I don't know, five foot ten. <laughs> so the body has to make something up. So it makes five foot ten. It can make seven foot one. Now, everybody see that? So the more spillage you have on your chapters, well, you can't read that book fully anymore. Any so if you have a novel right now, and you have stains or coffee stains all knows? over it, we you're not going to get the full picture of what that novel is, is saying total amount of chemicals. The That's what happens that, to that, the that, DNA that in your is, body. These your chemicals change the chemicals, the way your, body your body's ability it. to get it's rid of those chemicals. It's called epigenome. So how do you get, how do you detoxify? First thing you do is learn to reduce your exposure. That's Everybody why you have all those, I, I think I see green products back so there. That's what can all these green the cleaning chemicals. agents. So toxic chemicals can, all these can really have cosmeceuticals that are naturally based. All those things will reduce your body burden. Drinking purified water. You know, they did an analysis of 10 bottled waters. I won't tell you where they took the bottled water, but it was a, a big chain in the United States. They found 
38 contaminants in bald waters. One of the contaminants they found, besides fertilizers and pesticides, one of the contaminants they found was, was Tylenol. So you got to ask the question, how does Tylenol get into the bald water? Think about it. The Tylenol that you flush down the toilet or in your sink, that goes down to some kind of treatment center, eventually goes on the ocean, goes up, comes back down, goes into some of this rainfall, and it becomes your drinking water. So, you know, there's no such thing that we're losing our water. What, where's it going to go? We live in a fishbowl anyways. Whatever comes up must come down. So our water is contaminated, and that is having an impact on our physiology. So reduce chemical exposure, and secondly, improve your body's ability to get rid of those chemicals. And you can do that by learning a little bit about detoxification. <laughs> this drawing that I made. And basically, see, the liver is the organ of detox. See, you cannot get rid of chemicals on your own. They can't simply get excreted out. They got to go through this thing that we call phase one and phase two detoxification in the liver. And it looks something like this. Remember, I always try to simplify things. It's like this. A toxic chemical is like getting oil paint dried on your skin. Now, when the oil paint is on your skin and it's dried, you can't wash it off with water or soap. What do you need? You need to do phase one. What's phase one? Rubbing turpentine on it. And that's what phase one is. Phase one is known as bile transformation. You're changing the consistency of that toxin. So you rub uh, turpentine on it. And once after you've done the turpentine, then you go phase two. Phase two is taking a cloth and wiping it off. And once that cloth is wiped off, that's called phase two. And that, in phase two, from a scientific perspective, is called the conjugation phase. You're actually conjugating the turpentine, the paint, onto the cloth. And then comes the elimination part. That cloth then goes inside your bile. That bile then goes inside your gut. And it's got to go out of your system. Now, this is where it becomes tricky. Because... Bile, remember I told you where bile comes from? The gallbladder and the liver. The liver pushes the bile, goes into the duodenum. That's carrying the toxins. That's the cloth. It's going to go down to your small intestine. Now 98% of bile goes back into the blood. Gets recirculated unless fiber is present in the gut. Now you ladies know why it takes so much fiber. <laughs> it binds the bile and eliminates it out of the body with the chemical toxins. So you need to do fiber. You know, when I was in first year Bastyr, I remember my roommate, this guy was always detoxifying. He looked like crap. He looked terrible. He was green. He was jaundiced. He couldn't walk around. He had no energy whatsoever. And I'm going, what the heck are you doing? Like, you're crazy with this detox stuff. No, he thought he was doing the right thing, but he was doing the wrong thing. I could tell. I mean, I, I, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look like a guy who looks sick. And he goes, oh, no, this is just the die-off effect. I go, what die-off effect? This is not looking good. And so what he was doing was he was fasting the whole time. He was fasting for two, three weeks. He was drinking water and then some juicing. But the problem is, look, nothing is binding the, the, the bile. You have to bind the bile because that's where the chemicals are. So you've got to be able to bind it. So you have to have fiber because toxins are coming out. Let me give you an example of what I mean by... There was a great study done recently. 65 female patients put on a weight loss program. Calorie restricted diet with exercise. And they measured many parameters. I'm only going to tell you two that I'm interested in because you're interested in them. They measured T3 levels, active thyroid hormone. And they measured organochlorine levels. Organochlorines are the most common form of pesticide found in foods. That's how you want to buy the organic products. Now, what happened was this. As these women were losing weight, their organochloride levels in their bloodstream were going way up. Why were they going way up? Because they were, that organochloride, those pesticides were stored in the fat. And as they were losing the fat, it was going way up. And then what was happening? As the organochlorines were going up, they were attacking the thyroid gland and reducing T3 levels. So their metabolisms was dropping. 
And therefore, they couldn't lose any more weight. They would plateau. And how many people plateau when they go on one of those programs? And then what happened when they went back to the regular diet? They gained even more weight because their metabolism had been altered by the pesticide level being released from the fat tissue. Isn't that interesting? That's pretty wow, right? So that's why you got to bind the stuff. You got to bind it with the bile, with the fiber. So fiber is an important component of any detoxification program. But he was eliminating a lot of his toxins, but he wasn't getting rid of them. Right. They were, they were, he was flushing it, but he wasn't getting eliminated. So he was, he was, he was, he was, they were loosening up from all this tissue. They were, the liver was processing them, but they were coming right back. So then he was building up toxic levels because he was unbinding them from where they were being stored. So his toxic levels were growing, growing, growing. And so he was starting fires all over the body. Because that's what they do. They start fires. Because, see, think about this. When you have oil, when you have oil paint that's dry and you put turpentine, turpentine is very toxic. That's what happens when you, when you go through this. It becomes very toxic. For example, when Tylenol gets broken down, if you had, if you were, if you were, got drunk one night and you had a hangover the next day it's because the body can't get rid of the alcohol fast enough and this phase two right here this slows down because you only have so many clots it's got to wait to catch up this one is always active it just keeps going non-stop so it's breaking down alcohol to a level but this one gets blocked so you get a backlog of turpentine and oil and oil paint because you don't have enough cloth to wipe it off. So for example, say that my whole body was covered with, with, with oil paint dried up. I put turpentine all over my body. Think about all the toxic chemicals. And I, can only, I only had enough cloth to clean my arm. Well, the rest of the turpentine is poisonous. Now what happens with Tylenol, this is, actually this is something important for all of you. If you have a hangover and you take Tylenol, the byproduct of Tylenol is something called N-acetyl benzoquinone emine. That's a long word. <laughs> that chemical is so toxic, it can dissolve your liver in 36 hours. That's why you see a lot of Tylenol poisonings. And the reason why that happens is because it can't go to phase two because phase two is blocked up. So it's, it's really important. So you've got to make sure that you do things the right way. And so if you have a hangover, do not take Tylenol. Take something else because it can have consequences. Did you take fiber after drinking? What's that? How about fiber after no, I'll tell you what you can take. After drinking, you could take curcuma longa because curcumin is a powerful antioxidant for the liver. And they actually, there was a, a, a Japanese study that just came out on the new product called Theracurum. And what they did was they were able to show reduction in circulating alcohol when they took this. Because it does speed up the breakdown of, of uh, actually, it actually reduces acetaldehyde in the blood, which gives you the hangover. What about milk thistle? milk thistle too. Milk thistle is another one. This one has a good clinical study that was pretty impressive. They actually were able to show reduction in liver enzymes by 16% as well. So it was pretty, pretty impressive. Okay, so cleansing. Okay, so this is all, all quickly because I only have like four minutes. But when you cleanse, the first thing you want to do is you want to load up with antioxidants. For the first week, load it up. So you can come here. They can tell you all about antioxidants here. They're very, they're, they're, they're very educated, the staff here. Load up with antioxidants. Juicing at home is antioxidants. So load up. With, you need to load up with lots of fire extinguishers because when you detoxify, you're going to make a lot of fires. So you need extra, de, you need extra, extra fire extinguishers. So the more antioxidants you put, the better. So what are antioxidants? Alpha lipoic acid is an antioxidant. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. N-acetylcysteine is an antioxidant because it can increase the levels of glutathione in, in the bloodstream. Um, uh, a curcuma longa is an antioxidant. So there's lots of good antioxidants that you can load up. So you load up for the first week. And then week one and week two, you can do a whole body cleanse. So whole body cleanse, these are great kits. They're very, very popular. They have all the different ingredients. They'll have like the fiber, they'll have the, the liver support ingredients, and they'll have the, the ingredient that can help you move stool and bile out of the body. These are things you want to always utilize when you're doing a cleanse. So you, and, you, and cleanse is not something you do once in a blue moon. You should do at least three to four a year. Because detoxification is an ongoing process. Your body's always detoxifying 24 hours a day. 360 days a year, you're going to be detoxifying right now, you're detoxifying. So you want to support that system as much as you can. 
It's an important system. This is why we feel like, have you ever noticed what is wrong with us? <laughs> like, you know, like something's always wrong. You feel tired, you feel fatigued. Well, think about all the stuff that your body has to deal with. It's incredible that we are so resilient to some degree. But we all have these things that are going on because the body, the biochemistry of the body is very complex and we are bombarding with lots of different things. Whole body cleanse is a, is a, is a, is a, is a really good one, good one to do. It's, there's three parts to that. There's a, there's a fiber component uh, that you take morning and night. There's a uh, liver component because you always want to support the liver. And then there's a, a laxative component. And, what's, and you know, what's unique about the laxative, it's not a herbal laxative which stimulates the smooth muscle. It's an osmotic laxative. Osmotic laxatives allows water to enter the lumen of the small intestine. So it works on water. It does not work on, because some of those other ones are addictive. You don't want to. You don't want to stimulate too much stimulation of the of the small intestine wall. You don't want to stimulate that muscle. Yeah, you can eat. Yeah, you can eat. Um, what are also something else to show you? Like not all herbs are the same. Here's an example of two identical herbs, identical to every aspect. They're both standardized. This is milk thistle. One of them is bound to phosphatidylcholine, creating something we call a phytosol milk thistle, and the other one just stayed the same. So it's the same milk thistle, except one of them is bound to phosphatidylcholine. So what they did here was they gave it to these patients with liver cirrhosis, and they measured blood levels after 2, 4, 6, 8, and 12 hours. Look at the difference. The same amount of milk thistle, yet yeah, look at the blood vo volumes of this one. Seven times the blood volumes of this one, because this one got into the blood faster. And, well, got into the blood. The other one didn't get into the blood. Absorption is another aspect of pharmacology that's important. What brand it's, absorbs? This is, well, this one is the one that's in the, uh, in the whole body cleanse. Is the phytosome one, yeah. It's a good one. Uh, another thing that, you know, I'm, I'm going to throw this at you. Do you guys carry dim in the store? Diendomethane? Yeah, diendomethane is rock, man. This stuff is good. It's called diendomethane or dim, diendomethane. It's, a, it's an extract from broccoli. And let me give you a, a couple, of, I'll, I'll tell you what it is, okay? So, well, let me, actually, I'll go to this one. Okay, I'll, I know this looks complicated, but it's actually really simple. You know me, I'm going to simplify it. Everybody will understand it. Diendomethane is from broccoli. And, you know, the capsules that they carry, probably a couple of the, I mean, I know the ester balance for enzymatic. Two of those ester balances equal to like two pounds of broccoli. And I take them every day. I got them in my bag. I can even show you. And what happens is this. You're, we all have estrogens in our body. One of the problems is that we're carrying lots of estrogens because of the xenoestrogens from the environment. Like there was a lady, her name was Rachel Carson. In 1960, she wrote a book called Silent Spring. She really is responsible for the environmental movement. And what Rachel Carson talked about, she talked about alligators in Florida lakes that were going from male to female because of the pesticide levels in the water that was acting like estrogens. This is 1960. And guess what? We got the same problems now. We got BPA, bisphenol A, which is xenoestrogen. We got phthalates that act as estrogens in the body. So we have a lot of these estrogens, and these estrogens that look like estrogen, act like estrogens, cause problems. So for example, Here's two estrogens in the body. You have in your body, your body naturally makes three estrogens, estradiol, estrone, and then there's another one called estriol. These estrogens get broken down in the liver and they become these estrogens, 2-hydroxy, 16, and 4-hydroxy. These ones are really good. They're protective, they're anti-proliferative, they make you feel good. These ones can have negative effects. They're carcinogenic. They make things rapidly divide because estrogens makes things grow. These are the ones related to cancer. These are the ones that give you a lot of the symptoms during PMS. They can also make a man's prostate gland grow because the man's prostate has estrogen receptor sites. What DIM does, diendomethane, it pushes the body to create these good estrogens, not these dangerous ones. And it works very fast. This is a great, great product. I mean, this is a really uh, a charm. And you want to do this, especially when you're detoxifying. So diendomethane, different from 3-endocarbinol. I use a lot of diendomethane. Lots of it. I take it every day. Is it on the table? I don't think it's on the table, but it's, uh, they have, they, I'm, I'm sure they have it on the shelf. For prostate health? 
for, for prostate. Yeah, you could use this for prostate health as well. I give it, one of the things it does, it also frees unbound testosterone. It has a lot of other applications, but th this is a really strong application. Yes, it, it will definitely help you with your prostate. And don't, and make sure you dose it, dose it right. So this is a, an example of levels of DIM and, and changes in the ratio between the, the 2 and the 16. So see, the, the, there's a lot more 2-hydroxyestrogens when you're taking 100 milligrams of DIM a day. So it really does change the ratio. Yes, you have a question? Yes, I want to know, can these detoxes, can they help you reverse glycosation? You talked about sugar. Oh, glycation. Uh, yeah, yeah no, no, actually, glycosation is actually when there's an enzyme involved. So you're, you're not, you know, that was an inaccurate. Uh, yeah, these can help you. They can help you to some degree. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that you can take. Benfotiamine, for example, is, is an anti-glycation product specifically for glycation. It's called benfotiamine. Carnosine is another anti-glycation ingredient. Yes, back there. It's, it's for example, I'll, I'll tell you how you know. Okay, for example. If you're doing it because you have PMS symptoms, if you're doing it because you have a migraine headache related to the period, you'll know. Like, you know, there's, uh, there was somebody that, I j actually somebody I just, she was not a patient of mine, but she came to me, she goes, you know, Gaetan, I've been taking this, you know, di this diendomethane that this doctor prescribed for, you know, like, six months and you know I, these headaches they're, they're the same I think it's you know it's not doing anything I go what's your dosage and she was told me what kind she was taking I go no 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 that dosage is way too low I go this is what you got to take you got to take four of these tablets forget about those just take four of these tablets and uh, you know she followed those instructions and you know uh, I just talked to her two weeks ago she says I never got any headaches this last month yeah well, how do you know I don't have symptoms? I have symptoms. If you, oh, okay. so if you, don't have any symptoms. if you don't have any symptoms, then right, you don't, right. If you don't have any symptoms, or if you're detoxifying, it's good for detoxification because even detoxification, you really, but you know, detoxification, you do it for a short period of time. Very good question, though. I, I see, I see your point. Because I said dosage, you go, yeah, exactly. Well, what, what do you mean? I feel, I feel fine. <laughs> yeah. So if you have, like, for example, prostate conditions, where in the, the, some of the symptoms of prostate, you're going to be getting up in the middle of the night, urinating, your, your urine flow will be diminished and won't be a, a, as forceful. So if that changes, you know, your, 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 that, that's how dosage can be. Because it does vary from patient to patient. And I'm all about dosing right. All about dosing right. Without the, do the right dose, nothing works. Really, it's, it's just uh, with everything, everything, everything is about dosing. And I find that there is differential from patient to patient based on all sorts of different things, based on the way they, how they absorb things, based on how they respond to it. There's, there's all sorts of, you know, and, and, you know, I can show you Texas Today, three patients. It worked. <laughs> it worked better. I saw a difference though. All, all, all about dosing. People that have, you know, they can't walk or serious back pains or, uh, osteoarthritis of the hips. I mean, you know, some serious condition. I, I usually get the, you know, really tough, tough cases. And, um, um, you know, so, you, the, you know, I've learned that dosing is such a, such a, a big, big critical component of, of, of getting things, uh, making, uh, having success with, with, with patients. Yeah. For detoxing, what do you think about DMSA and EDTA and charcoal? Yeah, you know, uh, those are, um, uh, you know, EDTA, uh, DSMA, I mean, these things, they, they loosen um, heavy metals from the system. But you've got to bind those metals after, right? So EDTA, I know, binds some, some heelation metals. I mean, we, we use it uh, for chelation therapy. Um, uh, charcoal, I mean, you know, the, the concept of charcoal is absorbs things. But really what you want, you want the absorption of fiber. Because the fiber is carrying a lot of these chemicals. So fiber is the real, much, much... Uh, better component to use. And the body has detoxification systems built in. They really, really do. And so you have to try to activate those systems. Uh, but the EDTA, I mean, you know, they, they've been using it for chelation therapy for years. I haven't used it, you know, I haven't done IV chelation with EDTA. I've, I've used some other technologies for cardiovascular disease. And I try to get, again, I try to get to the crux of heart disease, which is not, is not cholesterol. I've been preaching this for 20 years.
It's not cholesterol. It's not cholesterol. It's the damage. See, what happens is, here's, here's your blood vessel. You open that up. You get you got a scratch in the endothelium. That's what happens. There's a scratch. So a scratch looks like an apple that browns. When you slice an apple, half a brown. So you get browning in the endothelium in that slippery layer. Once you get that browning there, then inflammation begins in that area. Then platelets stick to that area. Then cholesterol can deposit. If you don't get this browning, you can never get heart disease, ever. It's impossible. It's an impossibility that will never happen. I don't care how high your cholesterol levels are. That's why, have you heard of the French paradox? People living in, 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 in southern France, northern don't have heart disease, yet they have a high cholesterol because they drink red wine. And so what happens there is, it's like this analogy. Take an apple, slice in half, squeeze lemon juice on it, the apple doesn't brown. Why? Because the lemon juice is an antioxidant. If you have antioxidants protecting the blood vessel wall from browning, you can never get heart disease. And what causes that? Free radicals, things that cause fires. Blood pressure can also cause that because it can cause tears. But if you don't get that tear, you can't get heart disease. So how to do it? Antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. Then you got to solve. And, and what's my case for that? Easy. People that have bypass surgery often, well, anybody who has bypass surgery is on blood thinners, they're on cholesterol-lowering agents, they're always on stand drugs. And what happens to those people? After five years, they got to get stents. If that was the causative factor of what created the atherosclerosis, then they would never have to get stents. But they do because the atherosclerosis continues. Why does it continue? Because the bottom line is the antioxidants. That's the key, man. Man, wrong word. <laughs> That's the key. Does the cleansing plant have antioxidants to take load up on? Yeah, there's some antioxidants. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, curcuma lung is, is a big, powerful antioxidant that I would use. I use it every day. I'm, I'm never going to stop taking it. It's, it's very, very good. It's a great, great product to take. Huh? It's in that book, yeah, which you're going to get free, right? Right? <laughs> I think. Oh, with a purchase. Oh, with a purchase. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.